All right. Uh, I want to take a moment to welcome everyone here. This is uh, another lecture in our continuing series for um, EMS and pre-hospital care uh, on behalf of the uh, Baltimore County Fire Department, uh, the Fire Academy, the EMS office. Uh, welcome. My name is Dr. Jeff Sagal. I'm the medical director for the Volunteer Association and one of the fire surgeons. This is Dr. John Dunford. Uh, John Dunford comes to us from Wilson National Center. He to work. John started out as a graduate from Creighton University School of Medicine in Neurology. He was a servant in the military as a neurologist, uh, got out of the military, got a little bit smarter, and became an anesthesiologist. And now he's a neuroanesthesiologist and chief of neuroanesthesia at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center. Uh, and also had the poor misfortune of taking over one former as an education director for the medical students. But he has agreed to come and talk to you guys again today, the second half. His previous lecture was on seizures which was pretty cool. Uh, the lecture is going to be on the emergency management of the stroke patient. And with that, I'm going to give this to John. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is it? I can't hear them. Oh, okay. So that's just for that. Oh, I got you. All right, let me strap this on for, for the viewers at home. All right. <laughs> Well, thank you again for the invitation to come up to come up here to the Baltimore County Fire Department. I'm told by Sean Barenhaus that uh, the video here uh, travels, and then a lot of folks watch the video. I don't know if that's the case, but uh, it's nice to have a live audience. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm also told that we have a couple hours together, and I'll sort of look at you for body language to see if that's too long. Uh, I could go on. I could really go all day, really, on this. But uh, uh, so we'll hopefully work together so that uh, I can keep your interest and uh, uh, it could be a good time for a, a rewarding experience for both of us, Don't all of us. Right? Now first, I need to kind of get a feel for the audience. You know, so for BLS uh, trained folks, uh, BLS, okay, and then for the AC, ALS, uh, ALS, okay. And, uh, and people from the community that are just here anyway, uh, nobody, okay. Um, in the next hour and a half or so, what I wanna do is share with you the pre-hospital management of stroke. So that, and it is my hope that when you leave here, you will, be, you will with confident, co with confidently be able to go into a, a home, uh, uh, anywhere really, and diagnose someone who's having a stroke. To activate EMS, to come to the scene if you're a paramedic, to do an evaluation of someone for stroke, help dispatch, decide and triage the patient for the right location that you, that, 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 where, where the patient should go next. And then, once you arrive in, in route, I want you to develop a fundamental understanding of what's going to happen in the ED and in the hospital in the first few hours in the, when you're managing someone with a stroke. Because if you have this image in your mind's eye, then you in the front lines can be very helpful in facilitating the activation of their emergency response service in the hospital. Because just as we are first responders, in the hospital they are first responders. Because time is brain. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, why time with a stroke is brain. And arguably, as a first responder, truly, in the whole, all the procedures we're gonna talk about, I think you're gonna see that you're probably the most important person in potentially deciding whether someone has a permanent dis neurologic disability, if not survives, truly, even more so than other things, even acute MI. Time really is brain, and uh, we have to be able to take care of patients who have stroke. All right, so John done for stroke, here's our date. Now, I wanna show you a video, okay? Now, I wanna imagine, this is our, you are now in the parking lot with this lady, and you, you're gonna evaluate her, or, and or you're called to see this lady. So let's look at this video for a minute, if I can get it to, uh-oh. 
shoot. Um, I'm having trouble getting the, the, maybe this is messing up my mouse. Hold on a minute. Oh, Lord. Hmm. Uh, you can see the mouse on the screen. Uh, do you see a mouse? Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, I see it. Oh, cool, cool, cool. All right. No, oh, is it working? Now, bear with me, it might zip into YouTube for a second and you'll get an advertisement. So if you get an advertisement, you can thank the YouTube people. All right, don't, don't watch this part. That's not, it's just advertising. All right, skip the ad, skip the ad. It's like a 642 and the sensation is happening again. Smile, Vincent, smile. Notice the left face is drooping. She has slurred, slurred voice. I'm trying. I don't know why this is happening to me. It happened this morning again. And when I got to the hospital Monday night at 1230 in the morning. So now I'm taking a picture for an example of what happens. It's 643. So she's having trouble word finding, isn't she? Her droop in the face. She is dysarthric. She has a left-sided arm, left-sided arm weakness. She's having trouble speaking. All right, so let's stop this for a second. Okay. Oop. I don't want this one. I want to escape. Okay, gotcha. Hmm? Oh, 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 I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, sorry. Now let's stop this. Okay, we're going to go back. All right, now. So let's review. What is, let's imagine what is going on with this young, this lady here. And let's see how we can help her. What do we know? Her left side, what's that? But she knows she's had a cat history over 24 hours. She's had, she's had a transit ischemic attack before, hasn't she? In other words, she has had the similar symptom and then went to the emergency department and got let go. And here it is again, and she's making a video. Not uncommon for patients who have a transit ischemic attack, a, a brief stroke, it's not technically a stroke because it's not, because it's transient, but an ischemia, in other words, a part of her brain that's not working, then it gets better. Why? Because probably an embolism has come off maybe a, a carotid or she has a, a thrombosis in her in the brain in her blood vessel and so she has he's had a transit ischemic attack and in fact as many as 50% of people with transit ischemic attack who develop stroke will have one in the next 24 hours very common very common right and this is why it's so good she's making this video so she can show the ER people and go look look I'm having a TIA, you need to evaluate me. Now there's two mimics for this, seizure and migraine. She could have a complicated migraine. But very likely, this lady has a stroke, okay? Now, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, she's nuts, but she's not, okay? In other words, she has got the weakness, she's dysarthric, she's having word finding difficulties, her left arm is not moving, and her left hand is weak, okay? We see this, if she has a stroke, and we're talking about what exactly a stroke is, 7.5 miles of neurons are dying per minute that she sits here like this, that can't come back. All right. So let's talk about stroke for a minute. Is that, does that make sense? But now notice, and, and again, this is important that she's had a deficit already. In other words, it calls, it really reinforces the fact that this is probably real, potentially. Right? It's not something in her head necessarily. And of course, that's always a diagnosis of exclusion. Oh. Uh, all right, well. So it's not moving. Sorry.
Oh, all right. Normally you just. Uh, sorry, let's see here. So let's see if we can just get this on. Go uh, to uh, just usually I just go full screen. There we go. Okay, thanks. Just maybe it was just the video interface. Time is brain. Time is brain. Now, what is stroke? Stroke is a sudden medical condition in which a loss of blood flow to the brain, retina, or spinal cord results in cell death. Our brain uses a lot of glucose and a lot of oxygen per minute. And if we don't, it has very limited reserves. And so if you, have, if you cut off the blood supply to your brain, those neurons are going to start dying very, very quickly after just a period of a few minutes. It kills 140,000 Americans each year. That's one out of every 20 deaths in America. Some in the United States has a stroke every 40 seconds. In other words, from the time we've had this slide up, probably someone's going to have a stroke. Every four minutes, someone dies of a stroke. And each year, more than 795,000 people in the United States have a stroke. Now, we have to look at what a stroke, let's look for a minute briefly, and then we'll go into more depth about what exactly a stroke is. Now, to understand a stroke, we need to look at the blood supply to the brain. Okay, this is a little cartoon, but if you can think about it, we have our heart, okay, then of course you have the, the carotid arteries, vertebral arteries, okay, going to the brain. And how can I stroke? Well. I can have a clot come up from my heart through my vessels and clog up the, the artery in my brain. I can have a stenosis in my neck or a clot from that go up and clog my brain. Or, just like a heart attack, I can have a blood vessel in my head all on its own, get atherosclerotic disease and at some moment clot off. You can imagine the vessel spasms a little, then opens and spasms and opens and maybe my symptoms will come and go a little bit with a TIA. But either way, that's the blood supply. Now, when we cut off the blood supply, there's two major types of ways in which we can stroke. One is like a heart attack, a thrombosis. It's called a lacuna or a little lake. Why? Because pathologically when these patients die, you'd, the, 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 the pathologists would cut their brain open and see a little lake where the liquefaction necrosis was from their stroke, from the, where, the spot where the stroke was. But nevertheless, it's just a, a, a blood vessel that clots off and, uh, and not an emboli, it's not from anywhere else, it just clocks off. And that section of brain doesn't get any blood. Or an embolic stroke, a large vessel occlusion. In other words, you have a clot that flakes up and it clogs off a very large blood vessel, very proximally, very, you know, right, right where the blood vessel enters the skull. Now, why is this distinction so important? The reason why this is so important is because we have ways now of putting catheters up into the brain from the groin if somebody has a large vessel occlusion to suck the plug out. Much like if you have a clogged sink, right, and there's, my daughter gets all this hair in there, if I can't get the hair out with the drain oil, which is TPA, I could put a snake down and pull it out. Now they have snakes that can pull it out, right out of your head, through your groin. These are called stent retrievers. From an EMS perspective now, we, at the national level, the, the American Heart Association, is training all of us to be able to recognize in the field whether or not the blood vessel that is occluded is very, a very large vessel that needs a retriever, because then we have to send them to a special center, versus the Drano, the TPA, which we give them universally now. And more and more, this has become more into play when we look at our different stroke centers. Oops. So let's go back. Now, so a couple of definitions that we have to have. We have to have the idea of the difference between a hemorrhagic stroke and ischemic stroke. Now, a hemorrhagic stroke is pretty easy. It's when a blood vessel busts, okay? Uh, you can bust in the middle of the brain, for which you're gonna call it an intracerebral hemorrhage. Hemorrhage meaning bleed, and then intracerebral in the brain. Or subarachnoid hemorrhage is just a way of a blood vessel kind of right outside of the brain busting, and then it kind of surrounds the, the brain with blood. So I can have a subarachnoid hemorrhage, or I can have an intracerebral 
cerebral hemorrhage. From this moment on, we're not going to worry about those strokes. We really, with their supportive care or neurosurgical care, but from an EMS standpoint, we don't have to decide really what hospital we're going to send them to necessarily. Okay, uh, more likely uh, we'll be triaged to a, a higher echelon, high, a, a center with higher echelon capabilities, like in this area, Hopkins or University of Maryland for these. But nevertheless, um, the, we don't, the, the, they're not going to get stroke treatment in the, in the emergency department, for example. So we're going to concentrate on the ischemic strokes. And what do we have? One is the thrombosis, which I just talked about. That's the, that's the lacunar infarct. That's the one that that kind of just narrows off on its own. One is embolic, where the clot comes from the heart or the carotid artery. It zips up and, and clogs the brain. And the other kind we have down here is hypoxic. This is if, let's say, somebody drowns, you know, and the brain doesn't get blood for a while. And then we start their heart. They have an asystolic arrest, but we do a good resuscitation. And now we're perfusing the brain. And then, of course, we, just, we have the hypoxia from that. What we're going to concentrate, though, on is thrombotic stroke and embolic stroke. And as soon as I can... Hold on. Okay. So, time is brain. Every second... 32 stroke. In that same minute, your brain loses 14 billion synapses with a B and 7.5 miles of myelinated fibers have gone every minute. Now, in 1995, by the way, when I was a neurology resident, I graduated in 96. If you had a stroke, what do we do? We said, sorry, you're hosed. <laughs> Basically, put you in the dark room, get, try to control your blood pressure, supported all the problems that can happen, and go, look, so sorry. And then in 1995, the Drano came out, the TPA. It's like, they said, look, you got this clot. Let's put some clot buster in your vein, circulate it around your body, and guess what? It worked. If we can get there within three hours at this time, this, this NINS trial, National Institute of Neurologic Disorders and Stroke, it's called the NINS trial. But it said for the first time that we honestly can treat somebody and make them better. If we can get into the hospital and get this Drano, this TPA, into their bloodstream within three, and now we know this can go to four and a half hours. Time is brain. And the single most important thing to making sure they can get this TPA into the patient because once they get in the hospital, they get taken care of. It's making sure the community, in the community, people recognize stroke, and we get them to the hospital fast enough. And then, in 2015, we've got a new, just just two years ago, right? We finally have a new device. They thought, gosh, when these strokes, these clots are going up there, we get the TPA, we can't get it out. Let's engineer a way of sucking these clots out of the brain. So the, uh, and, and finally, the engineers made this happen. So they put these stent retrievers up in there, and they go up into the brain, and they pull out the clot, as long as the clot is in a blood vessel big enough that they can put the stent retriever in, which is usually embolic otherwise known as a large vessel occlusion, an LVO. And we have to have this term LVO because the American Heart Association has it all throughout the protocols now for emergency management of people who have stroke, an LVO, okay? And this paper, the Hermes collaborators in 2015 said, look, these stent retrievers are here to stay. If grandma has, or anybody has, a clot come off from her heart or her neck into her head, and we have our lady there who's got weakness on this side, and the stroke is big enough to be proximal, so we can get a catheter up in the brain and suck out that clot, we can save their life. Truly. Yeah. But you've got so many neurons dying every minute, a million. If she's got three hours, Here's the, they do this, uh, is there, any brain left? there is because there's brain that's stunned but not dead. We'll talk about that more in a minute. That's the key. It's called the penumbra. The, the stuff that's dying is dead, but then you have the stuff that's punched. The other thing is it really speaks to how many millions and millions and millions of neurons you really have. You know, you realize how many billions of neurons we have in your brain. See. Now, and these are the treatments: TPA, which is going to go through a vein, 1995. 
Giant Retriever, 2015. Metronic, Metronic. I don't. That's who. That's who makes this one. I think. Anyway, uh, not that I have any. Um, I don't actually do these, and, and I have no disclosures or anything, but, but this is the, the Trever device that they use uh, to pull the cloud out. Now, what else do we need to know? We know now that if it's a large vessel occlusion, we can take it out with a little, with the retriever, and if it's a small vessel occlusion, the TPA will work. In fact, the TPA could work for both, really. But we also need to know, uh, and so we can reinforce these things, but we also need to know when they were last normal. Because if you woke up, if you, let's say you stroke 12, 14 hours ago, as you had said, those neurons are dead now, right? They're toast. You can't bring them back, right? So there's a time frame to this. So medically, we need to know the last, na last known normal. And when you go to the scene and you take care of someone, when you do your ample history and all the rest, what are they going to know? That they're dispatched and the hospitals want to know what is your last known normal? Everyone will want to know that. What is your last known normal? And we need to know that. For the TPA, and we have six hours now for our last known normal. Now, yes, by the way, there's more fancy techniques coming up, which I'll show you some pictures of in a minute, in a bit, where, gosh, we even can go ahead and decide that we can even have neurons that we can protect from the, take, uh, uh, help from the penumbra, uh, even uh, maybe up to 24 hours. But we'll talk about that in a second. Now, because of these 2015, in, that information 2015 with the stent retrievers, what did we find out? We found out that, okay, uh, we, we, and the fact that we know that EMS is so important with this, what happened? The American Heart Association came out with this, it's at the top, you can't read it, is Mission Lifeline Stroke. Okay, I'm gonna show you a couple of their, this is something from their brochure. Mission Lifeline Stroke. What Mission Lifeline Stroke says is, we need to get these patients to the hospital faster, and we need to recognize large vessel occlusions faster so we can triage them better, so we can get stents in faster. To do this, they, came, they looked at these stroke severity tools. These strokes, they, came, they said, let's make sure we have stroke screening schools. We, schools. we can go to our ALS providers and BLS providers who are in the, in the Delta units they go out there and say, okay, you can be our eyes here to determine whether we have a large vessel occlusion, whether or not we're going to activate our, our, uh, uh, our, and of course, Dr. Sagel has been telling me they have a stent retrieval center at Sinai, and it's just terrible because these people are coming in at all kinds of hours to get their strokes taken care of. It's just tough. But either way, these screenings, these, we have to be familiar then with these stroke screening schools, sc uh, tools and stroke severity tools. And as part of the Maryland state guidelines, which we'll show in the next hour, the Los Angeles motor scale is what we use. The Cincinnati Stroke Scale and the Los Angeles Motor Scale is what the state of Maryland has on its guidelines for the evaluation of patients with stroke. All right, now let's look at the Cincinnati Stroke Scale. FAST, F-A-S-T, this is what the lay public gets for the evaluation of stroke, okay? FAST, face, arms, speech, and time. It's the Cincinnati Stroke Scale, but they say, okay, face, facial droop, arm. You put your arm out, does one droop, pronator drift. And then speech, do I speak funny? Do they have dysphoria? Well, I can't speak at all. If you have those three things, you have a 72% chance. If you have one of those three things, you have a 72% chance of having a stroke. If you have three of them, you have an 85% chance of having a stroke. And you'll be right. Time is brain, 7, 7 miles a minute of neurons are dying. We can make a difference. Now, in addition, though, to the, the, this basic screening school with, with score, which was part of our ACLS protocol up through just 2015, right? Now, and this will, I anticipate it will be a part of the ACLS now, the new ACLS, we have to do uh, uh, either something to check for a large vessel obstruction. So we're going to add the Los Angeles motor scale, which is what is on the Maryland protocol. So instead of you do face, arm, and now, in addition, you look for grip. They have weak grip. That grip is really weak. That means, gosh, enough brain is stroked that most likely the occlusion is very proximal. It's in a big vessel, and we need a stent retriever to, to, to help this person. Uh, actually, in other places, the most common is the FAST ED, and this may overtake the Los Angeles motor scale. Basically, it's the FAST, the FAST exam, and then E is eye deviation and denial and neglect. In other words, if you have a sensory loss, like that lady said, I can't feel here, 
right? Sensory loss on one side, that's part of the FASTD. So that's, that's the other protocol, okay? Now, there are two main pages that I want you to bring you to your, to your attention because the American Heart Association are, are putting this out all over the place. And this is what you're going to see in a public place, a school, um, a uh, <laughs> fire department, okay, when they advertise about the, the issues that I've just talked about. First, I'll remind everyone that 690,000 people have a stroke for which we may potentially could treat of the 795, because remember, some of those are hemorrhagic, so we won't, stro we won't uh, treat all of them. Uh, one in 20 deaths are from stroke. This is a big problem. The FAST exam, face, arm, speech, T, since any stroke scale, right? Um, the fact that 4.5 hours for TPA and 24 hours they have up here, remember we said six, but they're having, putting 24 hours as much as for embolectomy with the stent retriever, right? And then the other page they decided to put up, I know you can't read it from the back, but is something that talks about the diagnosis of stroke. And up at the upper left it says, I have a haircut scheduled today. It's like, nope, still go in if you have symptoms, right? Uh, I, I, I want to take a nap. My face will get better. No, 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 you go to the, go to the hospital, right? Uh, my soccer game's almost over. I can't work. 6.5 million people die a year. Fast. In other words, we need an increased awareness by the whole population now because we have these stent retrievers and we potentially can help people with stroke. Now, oh, sorry, this, uh, this, this, the red didn't turn out here well. But if you look at the, the, sick, the, the eight Ds of stroke care, of course, this comes from the ACLS. All of you guys are ACLS certified, and I would anticipate, or most of you, many of you. But if you look at detection, dispatch, delivery, door, data, and disposition, all of that, of the eight, six of the eight, are directly, uh, the EMS is directly responsible for, including disposition, because now we're even going to be working with 911 and dispatch at some point to determine what center these guys are going to go to, depending on our transport time. Time is brain, and EMS plays a vital role in the treatment of stroke. Now, time is brain, you can imagine, and it may be in the future, as CT scans get cheaper, because again, that's the rate limiting step, you'll have these mobile stroke units. So again, if the population, the general population is trained well enough to look at FAST, and dispatch really truly believes that you're having a stroke, they can send one of these. Now, by the way, dispatch is only right, they only send EMS to, in other words, uh, they suspect a stroke only 50% of the time when there actually is a stroke. So in other words, you get a code uh, to go to someone's house to see someone, only 50% of the time is the dispatch right that it's a stroke. In other words, they underreport them, right? And then 53% of the time, we're right. You know, so we need to do better, you know, as far as uh, uh, the EMS. But nevertheless, this may be the future. So with these CT scans getting cheaper and cheaper, uh, we may be having these, these little stroke units go up. All right. Now, we need a little more. Okay, if we are going to go evaluate somebody in the field who's having a stroke, what I want you to do for imagine, it, it, bear with me for a minute, looking at anatomy, I want you to imagine not the fact that she's drooping, but what her brain is doing. Because everything, anatomically, when her hand moves here, there's a part of her brain that moves that hand. There's a part of her brain that moves her eyes. There's a part of the brain that moves her foot, right? The right brain moves the left side. The left brain does your speech, right? So we have to know, really, the anatomy and physiology of this a little bit more, especially if we're going to anticipate somebody's got a large vessel occlusion, if we're the ones out there evaluating these patients. So I want to run through this just a little bit more, just so we can look at the terminology that I've already introduced to you just, uh, just a couple minutes ago, but let's look at it again. Now, again, we have the anterior circulation, internal carotids, we have the vertebral arteries, four vessels that go up into the brain. Of course, clots could come from any one of those or from the heart to go up into the brain. You have, the, you have three major blood vessels, but the middle cerebral artery branches out over the whole hemisphere of the brain. We can see it there. And if you look, we have three major vascular territories in the brain from the internal carotid and the vertebral arteries. One is the middle cerebral, which is this red area. We have the anterior cerebral, which is the yellow. We have the posterior cerebral in the back. Okay? Now, the posterior part does vision. The fronter part, up here in the front, 
frontal lobe. Okay, and the, and the speech is on the left, okay? So let's look at these for a minute. Your frontal area is movement, okay? Whether you're moving your eyes, the right side of your brain, from top to bottom, speech, so the front is movement, motor. The parietal, the yellow part up on the top, is sensory. Do you have trouble feeling on one side versus the other side? Of course, there's sensory association, so there's a lot of other things it does, but let's just think sensory. Visual is in the back, and your temporal lobe to smell and auditory. Okay, it hears things. So if I in speech, that's my afferent center. They call it my Wernicke's hairy gland. It's, it's the part that's hearing is in my temporal lobe. So if I have a little stroke, a little lacuna stroke, just one of these things is going to get affected. Like uh, just my face and arm, because they're right close to each other on the motor strip. But let's imagine that I have an embolic stroke that's very proximal. So the blood supply to a whole bunch of sections is covered. So I'm going to have a motor area that's covered, a parietal sensory area that's covered, I'm going to have a speech area that's covered. If it's got all these different areas covered, then I know that the blood vessel to all that area is occluded, and guess what? I probably need a stent retriever, potentially. I need it's an LBO. Most likely, they're going to be going to the cath lab. Right? Now, let's look at that motor strip for a minute. If you look, there's the feet, chest, arm, face, teeth, tongue, and this is called the insular cortex, that's your intestines and stuff. But all of it is mapped out on your brain. And in fact, when I work in the operating room for an awake craniotomy, the skull is off, and I'll stimulate different sections while they're awake. And I can move the right hand, it's kind of cool, right hand moves, <laughs> move the right foot. Move the eyes, you know, you feel anything? Yeah, my arm's moving, okay? Because yeah. you can map it out when there's a tumor in that it's called eloquent cortex. Do, do, do. We're like a machine. So move your arm, move your arm. That's kind of cool. And you look underneath, the guy's totally awake, and you see his brain pulsing. Anyway, the point though is all of that anatomy is on the brain on the outside, running your arm. So mentally, when you go to the when you go take care of someone who's got a droop, you think, oh, that droop on the on the on the left side is the right frontal strip right here. That's what's occluded. I know that. You know what I mean? Because I saw the anatomy. So what I can say then is that if it's a large section of right side, most likely it's a large vessel occlusion, and most likely I'm going to need a stent retriever. Now, so key words we need. We need these. Hemorrhagic or ischemic. Hemorrhage means there's blood in the brain. We don't need it. We're not going to give, a, we're not going to give uh, anti clot medicine for that. Thrombotic or embolic. It's a large vessel occlusion. We need a stent retriever to take it out and anterior posterior circulation. Posterior circulation, why? Because it's coming up the back and going to these vital structures that are brainstem. And if that's occluded, it can be more catastrophic. And in fact, we have a longer time to try to get stuff out if it goes posterior. And of course, thrombotic or embolic, that's the kind of stroke that we are dealing with and hopefully will help with our TPA. All right, now. In addition, so once we look at the patient and try to tell where the lesion is, right side, left side, we know it's right side with that lady because her left side didn't work, then we have to ask ourselves, okay, is this a hemorrhagic stroke or an ischemic stroke? Guess what? We can't tell. She could have busted a blood vessel. And that blood vessel now is causing swelling. So what do we need to do? In addition, we have to do a CAT scan. And we have to image your brain to make sure that this stroke isn't the 15% that have blood in the head, right? Now, there's different imaging modalities we could use to go ahead and look at the brain. Now, of course, this would be done once we get to the emergency department, but just so you know what's going to happen there. One is you do a CAT scan. CAT scan, we'll talk about this more in a minute, it's a fancy x-ray that goes three-dimensionally, uh, and, and it's going to go ahead and, and look, for, look for a stroke. We could do an MRI. MRIs are much more involved and more expensive. And number three, we can actually squirt dye into your head. Much more invasive then. Of all these, by far, CAT scan is most cost effective and it is the standard. And from this moment on, really, that's all we're going to talk about is CAT scan. We'll talk about more in depth in a little bit. Now, how do we prevent this from happening? In other words, this is sort of the, the, the American Heart Association talks about how potentially we really need to notify everyone how do we prevent a stroke in the first place, right? Of course, hypertension, high blood pressure, cigarette smoking, heart disease, diabetes, 
anticoagulopathy, and normal blood, like sickle cell, right? Uh, a carotid brewery, if you have a stenotic brewery, if, if your heart is in AFib, you could have an embolus that comes up. That's the one time you might be on a blood thinner because you're in AFib. And lastly, like Our Lady, a transient ischemic attack. Highly significant indicator of a person with increased stroke. 25% of stroke patients have a previous TIA. 10% of those presenting to the ED with a TIA will have a completed stroke within 90 days and half of these within two. So if you have a TIA, in other words, a stroke that gets better quickly, transient ischemic attack, the chances of you having another one in the first two days is 50%. Right? Uh, if you're going to have it again. 50%, it's high. So 10% of patients presenting the ED with TA will have a completed stroke in 90 days. And of that 10%, so in other words, 5% of the total number is going to have it within the next 24 hours. So we have to have this concept of how to prevent strokes. You know, in that, it, it, from a population basis, that's very important. All right. So we have an idea of the of hopefully what stroke is. We know what's, what's ischemic and what's hemorrhagic. We know what's anterior and posterior circulation are now. We know what's embolic and thrombotic. We know what's a large vessel occlusion and what's ischemia, a small vessel occlusion, if you will. Right? Now, let's now look at how we manage these. Now, all of us, everyone's ACLS certified, right? Everybody, not everyone, okay, BLS, okay. If you do your ACLS, if you're an ALS, you're going to look, you're, you're going to have this algorithm up here, okay? Uh, this is um, what uh, everyone has learned in the past, okay? And basically, it's the pre-hospital management. It's a very busy slide, but the summary on the very top, it says identify the first thing, identify signs and symptoms of possible stroke, activate EMS. That's probably one of the most important things. The second thing down, it says, when you arrive, support ABCs, perform pre-hospital stroke assessment, establish time of symptom onset, triage to stroke center, alert hospital, and of course you'll check a glucose, right? Now the rest is the hospital, but I'll just tell you what they're doing. Within 10 minutes, they have to have done the, a, an exam, okay? Within 25 minutes, they have to have their CAT scan done. Within 40 minutes, it has to be read, and within 60 minutes, they have to have tucked, stuck the TPA in. Okay? And then we have a period of time, maybe up to six hours, in which we could potentially use a stent retriever. By the way, you can get TPA and stent retriever. That's not a problem. Okay? Now, that's not good enough now for the American Heart Association. The American Heart Association says, look, it, not everyone gets TPA. Now some people need stent retrievers. And so what they did was they said, look, we need a different system. So this is American Heart Association system now for pre-hospital management of someone with a stroke. So dispatch, we really need to work with dispatch because 50, over 50% 50 of the time, dispatch really doesn't fully comprehend the fact that the patient's having a stroke, right? If they are, you're gonna really activate, uh, activate resources. Next, we're gonna arrive. Once we arrive, we're gonna look at airway breathing circulation like we always do. The airway breathing circulation, you do four things you do with any resuscitation, even BLS. Are they responsive? Are they breathing? Do they have a pulse? And I activate my EMS, which of course is you, right? And you assess them, and then you're gonna get vital signs, secondary survey, glucose, right? Every time, that's what we're doing, every time. But now, as part of our survey, physical exam, we're going to do a fast exam. Say new if it sands or butts. Can they talk? Does their face droop? Do their arms go down? They do. One of those. Ooh, one of them, one of them means a 75% chance of stroke. But did they have a seizure? Could they have a seizure? That could be a cause. Do they have something else going on, like a, a migraine? Complicated migraines sometimes do. But for the most part, you have one of those, you're going to go, whoa, oh, right, maybe we're having a stroke. Right? Then you can do a finger stick, right? Because now it's part of your secondary survey. You do your finger stick, get Rick's finger stick. And then what happens? We're going to do a, an evaluation to see if you have a large vessel occlusion. In other words, we already did the FAST exam. So either we're going to do our Maryland stroke scale, or pardon me, the Los Angeles motor scale, which we just talked about, or we can do a FAST ED, which means in addition to FAST, you're just going to see if the eyes can go left and right, up and down properly, and whether they've lost sensation. 
And if the eyes don't move and they lost sensation, guess what? Almost definitely you've got an LV, you got a l large vessel occlusion. That means you're going to have to, somebody's going to have to get a stent retriever in there to take this clot out, right? And then, again, we go to the, the scene, and we go ahead and do our ABCs, vital signs, ABCs again with our primary, with our secondary survey, and then we do our sugar. And what are we going to do next? We're going to do our exam. Now it's a fast ED, looking for a large vessel occlusion, and then we do our ample history, which we all knew, allergies, medicines, past medical history, last meal events. But as part of that, we need to know the last known well. Last known well. And the ER is going to want that. Dispatch is going to want that. Before you transport, they're going to want the last known well, and they'll want the blood pressure, current meds, because if they're on an anticoagulant, a blood thinner, they're a, a TPA, right? Because they their blood's too thin and they'll hemorrhage. The chance for hemorrhage is too high. This is what we need to do. And once we have this data, what's going to happen? Busy slide. But basically, we're going to get help. We provide this data, and most likely, woo, as fast as we can, we're going to go to the primary stroke center, to a stroke center, a hospital that can give TPA. Now, if though, within 15 minutes, you can get to a place that can take that clot out, then, instead of going to the first hospital, getting the TPA, having the pulse people move them wherever it is to the next place, that's where we're transports, so I learned this, you're going to go right there first. So we have to have a concept of what Maryland has, I challenge you, with our stroke centers. And so we have this pyramid over here. We have, uh, we used to have an acute stroke ready hospital. Let's say we're in a rural community, you just do the TPA, you might even use tele, tele, telemedicine, and the neurologist may pipe in and do the exam kind of over the TV, right? But you get TPA, then transport. Then there's a the primary stroke center. Then you have a comprehensive stroke center. Now, what they've added recently is a thrombectomy-capable stroke center. The thrombectomy-capable, like Sinai Hospital, isn't a comprehensive stroke center, but it's a primary stroke center that can take, take clots out. By the way, and the reason why they don't get the comprehensive stroke center rating is through JCO, it's this huge production, so it's not really worth it. So they decide not to do it, I guess. But, but either way, uh, you have these centers. And so what we now know is we either have a thrombectomy-capable center, a primary stroke center that has that can do thrombectomy, or we have a comprehensive stroke center. That's what we have. Time is brain. We talked about what the ER needs to do. We need, T, we need CT within 25 minutes, red in 45, TPA in, in 60 minutes. Symptoms of stroke, we understand that. Now, this is a very busy slide. I'm gonna give you a couple minutes, no, just a couple minutes and we'll take a break, but when you're in the emergency department, right, we've done our FAST ED or our, uh, to see if we have, or our Los Angeles motor scale to see if we have uh, uh, evidence that we're having a stroke. But that's not the gold standard. Throughout the whole United States, the gold standard is this thing called the National Institute of Health Stroke Scale. So it's the NIH stroke scale. What's your NIH stroke scale? We have to be familiar with this because this is how the hospital thinks. The pre-hospital is supposed to ED, fast ED, but the fast ED is a shorthand of doing this test. Now it has a score between zero to 42, and it's a score, this is the kind of test you want to do poorly on. In other words, you want to get a zero. A zero is perfect, right? It's hard to read from the back, but I'm just going to summarize it for you. The first three, one is level of consciousness. So this is what's happening is they come in the ER, ED, while they're going to the CAT scanner. One of the stroke specialist PAs is sitting there, or, or a neurologist, is doing this exam. All right? And what are they going to do? Have you seen the FAST ED score? Okay. But now they're going to do this exam, and they're going to say, how alert are you? They're going to say, what's the month, and how old are you? Right? See how alert you are. You're going to say, they're going to say, open and close your eyes. Make a fist. Right? Then they're going to check your eyes to see if they move. Then they're going to check for visual fields. They're going to see your face is paralyzed. So look, arms and left and right are paralyzed. Legs are left are paralyzed. They're going to see if you're if you're uh, have ataxia, sensory, but also they'll check language. And they're going to do that with this picture. They'll show you this picture. And I challenge you, I think this is kind of fun. Unless you're a neurologist, the next time you see this picture is when you're having a stroke, right? I guess if, unless you're going to give it to the test. But now look at this picture. You can tell a lot about somebody. Or you can see the ladies there washing dishes and kids are playing. But if you've had a stroke, you may not see the fact that 
the boy's in jeopardy because he's about to fall on his on that on that, that stool, right? Or that the water is flowing out of the sink all over the floor, you know, potentially causing a problem. In other words, you you might see the facts of it, but you'll understand it. You know, you'll lose that ability. And the other thing, you will check things like name, a glove, a key, you know, uh, things like uh, say things like you know how, down to earth. You'll have them repeat. In other words, you're seeing how they can speak. Anyway, this NIH Stokes scale is the currency of physical exam. The currency of, of, of radiologic exam is the CAT scan, right? And our therapies we know are either TPA or a stent retriever. But this is how the neurologist thinks. And this is, uh, uh, so we need to be exposed to it. Now, look, if you have a one to four, you have a very minor stroke. And since the risk of hemorrhage is 6%, if we give you TPA, if you have a very minor stroke, we may decide, look, maybe we don't want to risk that hemorrhage. You're so mildly impaired, this is a very small stroke. Maybe we'll hold off on this TPA because it has a risk profile that's unacceptable. If it's huge, greater than 22, so much brain is damaged that if we give you the clot buster, it's increasing your chance for hemorrhage because that brain is so sick. So your hemorrhage rate might significantly increase. So the neurologists, how the stroke specialists, is how they earn their pay. They go, should you give you someone TPA if they're very weak, in other words, a very mild stroke, or if it's a very severe stroke? This is how they earn their pay and they make that decision. All right. Interestingly enough, if you look at the FAST score, remember the face, arms, speech, which is just the Cincinnati stroke scale, right? Plus, eye deviation and neglect, it is as good as the NIH stroke scale for determining if you've had a stroke or not. The difference is it quantitates your, quantitates your stroke a little bit less, uh, not as good as the NIH, but it'll tell you whether you've had a stroke. It's actually very good. Now, let's talk about CAT scans for a minute. Uh, we're going to go about five more minutes and we'll take a break. If you guys are okay, five more minutes, you're not dying yet. I hope too much. All right, let's look at CAT scans for a minute. We're in the emergency department. Remember, our lady had the droop. We've done, we've activated EMS. We've gone to the emergency department. We now are coming in. We've done our NIH stroke scale, which has complemented our FAST exam. We've done a really good history. We'll see whether there's a contraindication to TPA, and now we do this CAT scan. Now, the CAT scan is basically a fancy X-ray that X-rays you in all these different directions. And then you go into it and it does slices, slice, 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 and it takes a look at your brain. And this is what it shows. It's the one on the left. Now, interestingly enough, what can we tell from the CAT scan? If you look on the right, you can see hemorrhage. Here's blood, and here's subarachnoid hemorrhage, and that's inter and interlobar hemorrhage. Boy, we're not giving clot breaker to that, because that's just going to make it worse. Those hemorrhages go to the intensive care unit. Uh, the neurosurgeon may have to take care of them. It, we're not going to give them a stent retriever or TPA. But let's look at the left side. At the upper right is what a normal one looks like. And the majority of the time, when someone's had a stroke, their CAT scan is normal. Then there's subtle things. Uh, now this one's not so subtle. We can see right here that there's this large uh, decreased, uh, in, uh, decreased uh, intensity there. That's a ginormous stroke. We're not going to treat that because that'll hemorrhage. But here, you can see there's a little dot in the middle of the thalamus on the right, right there. That's a lacunar stroke. We can get TPA to that. Here, it's hard to see from the back, but, but there's a little white dot right here. Guess what? That's a clot sitting in the middle of the cerebral artery. That needs a stent retriever to pull it out. You can take that out and make them better. In here, it's a very subtle thing. You can see this ventricle is a little lower than this one, so some swelling has moved over, and the experienced neuroradiologist will say, hey, that's a stroke. Let's give some TPA to this guy. But CT will tell us whether, whether, whether our TPA is safe. Now, here's what's even more interesting. We can do an angio. Not only can you look, look at the brain, but you can put dye in it, and we can see, look, this middle cerebral artery is clotted off. This one's okay, this one's clotted off. So we can do a CT angio, and then know that that's clotted, and so the neuroradiologist can go in and suck that clot out and save their life. But even more interesting, maybe, is this one. That bunch of red, blue dots right there, that's a cerebral blood flow study. Now, instead of taking the CT and kind of cutting, doing it in cuts, cut, 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 as you put the brain in now, here what you do is you take one cut, exactly the same place, and you measure blood volume. 
And what happens is, per time, in the red on the left is more blood, and the blue on the right is less. What it means is the right side isn't getting that much blood. And by the way, this is the same patient. That looks normal. You can see the clot right there. And then the right side's not getting blood. What's even more interesting, then, is we can make these modern art here, but get something out of it. Because the bottom left is called the, is called the uh, uh, mean transit time. In other words, the amount of time it takes for the blood to go through the brain is really slow on the right versus the left. So the blood's going in there real slow. And then the blue up here is the blood volume. How much blood volume is on the left? And there's not as much. And you overlap them and you get this really cool little thing. The red is brain that is dead forever. It's gone. But green is a penumbra. That's brain that can be saved if the radiologist goes in or the neurosurgeon or neuroradiologist and sucks out that clot. That's cool. Now let's imagine that six, we wake up now with a stroke. Of course, last known well is last night. You wouldn't qualify for a stent retriever, right? But let's say now we go ahead and do this CAT scan right here and determine there's all this penumbra that could be saved. Guess what? You'll probably get a retriever. And in the future, this, this might be more important than time. It won't be the time. It's like whether we can actually save the brain. That's kind of cool, I think. And that is a cerebral perfusion study. Now, TPA. And then we have the endovascular thing. Now, TPA, it's a couple things. Remember, 6.4% of the times if you get TPA, you're going to stroke. So it's not a benign thing. You have to be very careful, right? Who we give TPA to. All right? If you do stroke, you use TXA and cryoprecipitate. That's more for the docs, okay? This is another complication. How many people have seen angioedema? Right? Angioedema, right? So oral angioedema is a complication of TPA. As soon as you see this, you're going to have to intubate that person before it gets like that. I'm telling you, <laughs> you'd be in deep doo-doo, right? You're going to treat this like an anaphylaxis. You need epi, uh, Benadryl steroids, um, uh, but any histamines. But again, that's that, that we have to anticipate after TPA, okay? In addition to the hemorrhage. All right, things to remember about TPA. We're not going to do it if we've had a head trauma. Makes sense, there's blood in the head. We're not going to put blood thinner in if you've had a hemorrhage, if you've had a surgery recently, if you have internal bleeding, or if you have a, clot, a problem with your blood that makes it so you don't clot right. You're not going to get TPA, right? Stent retrievers, when are we going to use those? If you have a, uh, a rank, in other words, the rank and score of less than two. Okay, in other words, if you have to be very well before you've had your stroke. Okay, if you already gorked. You know, you're so gorked. You know, that's so or if you are severely impaired, you know, you want to do the risk, risk the hemorrhage if you're already severely impaired. Uh, you want to make sure that the that there's a clot in the right segment, a proximal segment that you can get the scent retriever up to to take it out. Uh, your NH stroke scale needs to be greater than six. In other words, if it's small, you may not even give the TPA, right? Because the risk of hemorrhage is high. Uh, aspect score, that's a, a way of measuring CAT scans for uh, uh, ischemia. You want a certain number, less than, greater than six. And then you want this within six hours. Now, here's the thing. Let's imagine that we're going to put a catheter up in your brain, right? And then open it up. The brain arteries, unlike the coronaries, don't have very good adventitia around the outside. They could pop, right? So when you put the catheter up, every once in a while you're going to pop an artery. And that's a bad thing too. So this isn't totally benign. In other words, we have to, these guys have to be careful. But again, a complication, just like we had bleeding, is a complication about 6% of the time with the TPA, a rupture of a vessel, I don't have the exact number, is a complication of this. So we have to be careful. If someone's very well with a, with a uh, you know, an age score uh, less than six, maybe we don't want to risk it. All right. Blood pressure, 185 over 110. All the ALS people know this. That's a blood pressure for TPA. It has to be less than that. If they're not TPA candidate, you can let it run to 220 over 120. Very high, surprisingly enough. You can let it go that high. Um, aspirin. If they're not a TPA candidate, you're going to give them aspirin, much like you do, much like you're going to do a uh, heart attack. However, if they have TPA, you're going to hold off on the aspirin for an hour. So if you think they might be a candidate, don't give them TPA, don't give them aspirin. Okay, so you wait. That's going to be something they do in the hospital, aspirin. Uh, statin they'll give them, and um, they're going to go, if it's embolic from the heart, they may use uh, warfarin or hep. 
All right. Um, let's stop here. Okay, let's stop. You guys can take a break. In the next part, we're going to show a new stroke person and apply what we just learned looking at the Maryland guidelines. So we're going to go through them just exactly out of uh, the book, frame by frame, so that we can know what Maryland says, State of Maryland says we're supposed to do. Is that okay, hopefully? So let's review what we've talked about, right? We've said that stroke is a true medical emergency. We've said that truly the, the pre-hospital management for stroke is critical. Perhaps more critical than just about any diagnosis. Just about. I mean, I guess respiratory failure would be something more important. But, but still, it's very important that we have a, a fundamental knowledge of what stroke is and the fact that transport for stroke is, is very important. Okay? We know that there are two therapies for stroke that can be helpful. One is tissue plasminogen activator, which busts a clot buster, and then a sand retriever, which goes in and pulls the clot out. To me, it's like the snake in my drain when I can't get the drain. We know that the clot buster can cause you to hemorrhage, because it's a clot buster. So we have to be careful with what patients get it. And then the stent retriever itself can, can cause complications by breaking the vessel. So we have to be careful with that. We know that what do we need to go ahead and treat a stroke? We're going to need a good physical exam. We're going to have to, the NIH stroke scale, or the last exam, plus the LAMS, looking for a large vessel occlusion. We're going to need a CT scan. We're going to need a good history. We'll need those three things, particularly, and a glucose, before we're going to go ahead and put TPA in somebody. And once we put TPA in, it doesn't mean we still can't put the retriever in. So if you're at a center, primary stroke center, that can only do TPA, they can now be transported to a center that can do the retrieval. So from a transport perspective, we need to make sure we get to a center somewhere that can do the TPA, first and foremost. However, if it is a large vessel occlusion and there is a center within 15 minutes, the guidelines at the national level say, let's go there. And this is something we have to work at, you know, you have to decide uh, uh, maybe on a case-by-case -case basis or as a, in a systems way um, here. Yeah. Do you know what I came about that 15-minute time? Do you know if there have been any studies? No. Like, like, and actually, I was looking at the stroke, I was looking at the 2018 stroke guidelines, and it's, uh, they, there isn't any specific number other than, than there was, here's the, the main factor is they don't want to withhold TPA for this retriever. And so the idea is, look, if you get stuck in traffic and now you're outside the TPA window because you tried to go to some place for a stent retriever, then you're not helping the patient any. So the idea is to make it so that you encourage as much as possible the TPA, but you know, first and foremost, say yes, you understand that you need TPA first and foremost. And so 15 minutes then would be enough of, uh, uh, to, in other words, the place is close enough, especially with, with going code, Amber's on, that you can get the patient to that stent retriever place fast enough, they can get TPA and a stent retriever versus just getting the TPA. So it is a bit arbitrary, but that's the American Heart Association came up with. I actually kind of looked into that, and it's like, and then they actually have a little uh, disclaimer in the in the report saying, "Look, it's the best we can do. Uh, we're trying to figure this out." Uh, that's what we're hoping. It makes sense when you're in more rural areas, but like here, for example, if you take a stroke patient in Northwest and then they end up needing to come back to you, like trying to get the sign, it's going to be like two hours later. You're exactly right. And this is what we sit from a system standpoint is something we have to work on. Yeah. You're absolutely right. You know, it's a, especially with the new thrombectomy centers. When you just had Maryland, when you all you had was the comprehensive stroke centers. Uh, then uh, you know the transport times were really different, but now up here there's Sinai, right? Time Sinai is a thrombectomy center, and so again, intuitively it seems that yep, um, you know when you use your little computer program that tells you where to go, you know, perhaps uh, that should be uh, you know they should just it could encourage you to go there. Again, um, that has to be made at the local level here, uh, and, and a decision that that. Uh, 
right? And that then may be a little beyond my, my pay grade on that one, on the particulars. All right, so let's now look at a video of our next patient. And uh, this is from the internet. Doctors Joseph uh, Josephson and Jay English put this on. So I hope uh, that's, I'm gonna give him credit for the, the picture, and that's where it comes from on the internet. I don't know this patient, and so um, there's my disclaimer on that. All right, let's take a look and see what we can do. Hold your arms up in the air like you're holding up a pizza. Spread your fingers apart. Close your eyes. Keep your eyes closed. Okay, open your eyes. With this right hand, can you tap real fast? So he understands what you're saying, right? So he's a little slow there. Okay. Okay, now that's a little bit slower. All right, so what did we say? We had her left facial droop, we had pronator drift, we had slow movement here, and we had this left side working um, not quite. So left, the left leg looks like it's uh, weak also. So uh, that's what we have. Now remember, the right side of the body does the right brain does the left side. Left side of the brain does the right side, and the left side of the brain has a speech center. And, the, and he's clearly not a fa he he can understand commands. So at least we know that his his temporal lobe that does hearing is associating with his parietal lobe to understand what language is and can move. But nevertheless, so if we're presented with this person, uh, let's go ahead and and if you are his. Uh, brother at home, we're going to activate EMS, right? So we're going to say, okay, what are we going to do? And we're going to call 911. Now, strokes should be transported by emergency personnel. In other words, uh, that's one of the guidelines. And, 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 so, and most systems, the American Heart Association encourages in their in their in, in their. Uh, recommendations that you don't drive yourself or you don't drive your family or you're not going to drive this guy to the hospital. You're going to activate 911 and you get to the hospital in the most timely manner possible. If not for the fact that when you go through the door in the ED from the Delta unit, you know that you're going to get better, you get faster care, you know, off the bat. So dispatch then needs to know that yes, this is a stroke, right? So dispatch is gonna activate and they're gonna, you're gonna get a phone call. You guys are gonna get the phone call and you're gonna be, go to the, to the house when you arrive. Now, statistically, EMS spends 15 minutes at a house for a stroke evaluation. That's the national average, 15. And it's one of the ways, areas in which the American Heart Association is trying to decrease time, 15 minutes. To get out, that's the actual, uh, which actually, they're trying to get it even less. I mean, it really is a, a, a grab and go, as best as you can. Now, while you're doing your grab and go, you're still going to have to do an ABCs. You're going to do air rebuilding circulation. So you're going to air rebuilding circulation. You're going to, which of course you're going to do. You're going to do vital signs, right? Then you do your primary, secondary survey. Make sure there's nothing that you're missing. You're going to do a sugar. You're going to do a glucose, right? And uh, you're going to talk to anybody and get your ample history. And you're going to have a series of questions that you're going to ask in a minute. But in meanwhile, as part of your secondary survey, you're going to do your FAST exam, face, arm, and speech, which we just saw in, that, in this guy. That we didn't check his speech, but we saw his face and arm. And uh, would it be that I could examine this guy, you could check his speech. Right? So next, what are we going to do? We now know that he's having a stroke. We have to determine whether there's a large vessel occlusion. We'll do our FAST ED. In this case, we'll check his speech a little better. We'll look for eye deviation and we'll look to see if there's denial and neglect. Okay, we don't know if that was just motor and sensory because it should be just be motor, all right? So we need a little more information to really do a good determination for our physical exam. But well, I think we all agree that he's having a stroke. I mean, we can do that. Now, what do we need to know? We need to know our last, last known normal. Okay, we need a blood glucose, blood, blood pressure, current meds. Do we have any anticoagulants? And could this guy have some problems? In other words, if he has uh, an epilepsy, if he has epilepsy, could he be post-ictal and have a little bit of Todd's paralysis? In other words, the left side's a little weak. But we need to know that information and be out the door, okay? Now, if it's a large vessel occlusion, in other words, we are aphasic, in other words, we ha we're high on our FAST score, we're gonna think, okay, do we need to go to a thrombectomy center? 
now, of course, we're going to go to the stroke center where we're directed. But again, in the back of our minds, we're going to be thinking, okay, look, most likely they're going to need a stent retriever, right, to get this thing out. But we know that now because we've known about this, right? Now, if the fast ED score is greater than four, we know you have an 85% chance of having a left vessel, a large vessel occlusion. In other words, you're going to need a stent retriever if you have more than four. And the Los Angeles Stroke Scale, or Los Angeles Motor Scales, is what, what we use in our protocol, what, what is on the Maryland Protocol that I read. Not if I we, because I you, Maryland Protocol, right? But in Maryland, uh, that's what is used. Uh, again, if you have a four, uh, you have a, for a large vessel occlusion, you have over a 10% chance that it's a large vessel. If you have five, it's 25% chance that you have a large vessel occlusion. So again, the significant, the, the numbers on your Los Angeles stroke scale correlate with what you're most likely, uh, whether or not you're going to have a uh, large vessel occlusion. All right, so then, again, we'll decide what stroke center we go to. In other words, or it'll tell you, hey, look, off to the hospital, and he'll be, dro he'll be dropped off. Comprehensive stroke centers for the state of Maryland. There's three, University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, and Baby. Primary stroke centers, there's quite a few. City of Baltimore, um, up in... Uh, uh, anyway, uh, you can see the picture, but then if you look, endovascular capable centers, in other words, these are primary stroke centers, or anywhere they can do stints, you can see you got Johns Hopkins, Johns Hopkins, Peninsula Regional, Sinai, Suburban, University of Maryland. So in this area, really, it's the comprehensive stroke centers and it's Sinai. And if there's, and, and again, if there's any more that I don't know about, I don't know, but this was, this was as of, uh, I think this is 2016 that I got this from. Uh, from it's from the Maryland uh, guidelines, transport guidelines. Okay. So, they get to, one, they get to the stroke center. What's going to happen? He is going to go, he, from the time he comes in, it's an urgency. He's going to go into the CAT scanner. While they're doing the CAT scanner, they do the set, that NIH stroke scale, right? Uh, they're going to go ahead and s do a history on him, make sure there's no contraindications to TPA. They're going to do vital signs, make sure his blood pressure is okay. Uh, they want that CAT scan within 25 minutes. They want it read in 45 minutes. And if he's going to TPA, it has to be done within an hour. They're going to do their NIH stroke scale. You know about that. Uh, they're going to do uh, a cerebral perfusion study, potentially. But if it takes any time to do this or adds time, they won't. In other words, they're just going to get that TPA in first and foremost. They want to make sure that it doesn't delay the TPA if they're going to have TPA. Um, and then they'll decide, stand retriever or TPA. Okay, and here we are. Okay, so this is our step-by-step -step protocol for TPA. Now, let's go then spend the next 10 minutes on the seven pages of the exact wording from the Maryland protocols for the evaluation of someone from stroke. Okay, it's a, this is the brochure, step by step, and we're all supposed to know this if we are EMS providers in the state of Maryland. Okay, so let's look where we're looking. Uh, this is the Maryland Medical Protocol for Emergency Medical Services, and we're gonna go down to stroke, which is UU, right here, UU, and so UU is coming up. All right, first. You arrive at the scene, support ABCs, provide any needed BLS, ACLS, ALS interventions, okay? Next, determine presence of stroke severity using Cincinnati Stroke Scale. That's the FAST exam. Next, new onset or positive stroke assessment. No, transport, okay? But yes, okay. What is our last known well? We talked about this. What is the last known well? Is it within, particularly within three hours, four and a half hours? And well, when is it, okay? Then check a glucose, and then do your Los Angeles motor scale. In other words, you can check for grip, see if they got the pronator drip. They'll, they'll reinforce that in your mind's eye. If indeed signs and symptoms are consistent with stroke and onsets less than three and a half hours, transport to the nearest stroke center as a priority one and stroke alert. If not, transport to nearest primary stroke center. Now, frankly, you can help me with that, what the difference exactly <laughs> between those are. But again, so if you have a stroke and, 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 it's, and it's less than three and a half hours, transport to the nearest stroke center, priority one, Ambers, versus um, right, and stroke alert. In other words, you say, hey guys, we're coming. You know? <laughs> but that's what, the, that's what it says. And you can maybe help me with that, uh, that exact name. All right. 
Now, emergency continues. This is the next page. Uh, initiate general patient care. Presentation, patient may present with numbness or weakness, often on one side only. Difficulty speaking, blurred vision, dizziness, or severe unexplained headache may be accompanied by seizures or altered mental status, okay? By the way, the stroke can cause a seizure, right? Um, Facial droop, arm drift, abnormal speech, and the Los Angeles motor scale, which we've just talked about over and over. Okay, but that's sitting right here in the med medical protocol. And they have the centers. There they are. <laughs> that's where I got them from. Okay. Now, let's look at the Inner Hospital Transport Resource Manual. Now, Again, I was made aware of the fact that hospital to hospital transfers are not done by the fire department, okay? But it's a little telling because this is what the state believes patients should be transported for. And so this may uh, give us some insight in how the state thinks about stroke. And also this is more, uh, this is from 2014. So student retriever information uh, it was coming out but not coming out as quick. But you can see that, in other words, the, the, uh, um, some of the trials uh, hadn't been completed yet, but you can see already that the state is using and the need for stints uh, as a uh, in other words looking looking at the idea of a patient needing a stint and and saying hey look maybe we will encourage people to do inter hospital transfers okay so if you look it's um, primary stroke centers comprehensive stroke centers stroke guidelines for transfer so let's look at that 33 stroke guidelines for transfer okay so a discussion of goals of care recommended for the following cases, situations in which further interventions might be considered futile, <laughs> patients with advanced comorbidities, patients with identified as DNR. Patients not meeting the eligibility criteria will, will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. Time is greater than six hours from last well, and contraindication to TPA other than established above or uh, potential contraindications to um, emergency transport. So, but again, the idea is, look, we don't want to waste our time transporting patients that can't be helped if indeed they've had a stroke. Uh, timing of transfers. And again, I think the idea is you've got to someone in the hospital that really needs TPA or a stent, and for that, that hospital doesn't have the ability to transport or to, to provide that service. So this decision about IV TPA should be independent of and should not be delayed because of decisions about ERT. Consent. Every attempt sh uh, uh, to ad identify family members to consent for transfer and advanced treatment should be made. The lack of an available person to provide consent should not preclude a delay, discussion, or transfer of a patient for an ERT. If it is determined the patient is a candidate for transfer and evaluation for ERT, then contact the endovascular capable facility. Um, and I think end of ERT must be endovascular retrieval. You know, I don't know exactly what ERT stands for, but I guess it's, it's taking this, the clot out. Um, if it is determined that the patient is a candidate for transfer and evaluation for ERT, then contact uh, with endovascular capable facility should be initiated as soon as possible without delaying administrating TPA. In other words, give the TPA. Transfer should be initiated as soon as possible. There's no need to wait for the IV TPA infusion to be completed. In other words, while the TPA is going in, move them. And so you'll be transferring with the fusion going. Um, the sending facility should inform the patient and family that the patient is being transferred for consideration for advanced treatments, including endovascular retrieval treatment. I assume that's what that is. Uh, however, upon arrival at the endovascular capable facility, the patient will be reevaluated to determine which management strategy is most appropriate. Advanced treatment may include enrollment in a clinical trial. And um, it's boilerplate, but this is the last page. So, but it is what's here. Uh, acute ischemic stroke guidelines for potential endovascular recanalization therapy. That's the um, TPA should be administered to acute ischemic stroke patients as soon as possible. Patients with an NIH stroke scale greater than eight should be considered for emergency endovascular therapy. There's evidence-based data supporting the belief and safety of ERT for anterior circulation acute ischemic stroke. If the patient is a potential candidate for ERT, contact an endovascular capable facility immediately to discuss patient management. 
And again, greater than 18, uh, you want patients greater than 18, administer TPA per established guidelines. TPA should not be delayed for decisions about ERT, goal, door to needle time of less than 60 minutes. TPA does not preclude ERT. Um, IV TPA is the standard of care, first line treatment for patients within 4.5 hours. An age so scale greater than eight or occlusion of large artery on vascular imaging such as CT angiography or MRI. In other words, like boy, you want to see that. We already saw that a big clot means you want to transfer them. Um, Non-contrast head CT without hemorrhage or hypodensity of greater than a third of the MCA territory. In other words, you know, there's you don't have huge stroke. A patient's ineligible for TPA due to anticoagulant use or uh, recent surgery can be considered for ERT on a case-by-case -case basis. Transfer procedures should be urgently initiated with the goal of patient arrival at the receiving facility within six hours of last known well. And patients with basilar thrombosis occlusions should be urgently considered to transfer if, can, if, uh, uh, if transfer can be initiated with the goal of patient arrival within 12 hours. All right, I'm reading it, it's boilerplate, but it's, it's in your book. And that's the, those are the, the all the that is all the boilerplate that I can find uh, from when I scan the internet that applies to the state of Maryland and this county. So, in summary, what do we say? Time is break. Second, we have tools that help us screen for stroke: the FAST exam, and now the FAST ED, and the Los Angeles Acute Motor Scale. Um, we have their LAMS. We know that imaging is really important to confirm that there's no hemorrhage, there's no other contraindication to TPA, but even more importantly in the future, not too distant future, it'll also tell us how big the penumbra is so we can use other things other than time to determine whether stent retrievers and or, in this case, stent retrievers could be helpful. And then, we've looked at um, um, the actual treatments themselves. One is the, the TPA, and second, second are the stent retrievers of these endovascular treatments that truly are standard of care now in the last two years, and I think that their use will only continue. Now, much to the chagrin of Dr. Sagel here, who has to get up in the middle of the night to put the patients, anesthetized patients, to have the procedure completed. Thank you very much for inviting me to come uh, today. And if you have any questions, please, uh, we open up the floor. I think we do have a little bit of time on this. Just this year, they extended that window from three and a half hours the four and a half. Four. Yeah, yeah, oh, four. Okay, four and a half. It, it, most protocols now have four and a half hours. Uh, there's a trial called the ECAS trial that shows that up to four and a half hours, um, the complication rate isn't significantly increased. Now, the risk of hemorrhage uh, uh, isn't, uh, doesn't increase that much, and you potentially could save brain. You know, because at some point, the brain, like she had said, the very at some point, so much of the brain is dead that the TPA isn't going to help. Uh, well, that, that's, that, that's my exact question, because Dr. Alcorda, during this year, for endovascular. Now here's the point. For endo, it, it, here's what's going to happen. What's going to happen? I, I, it for post and, and that protocol you saw did have 24 hours, especially for posterior circulation strokes. Posterior circulation strokes you can push to 24. I anticipate that what's going to happen is that we're going to do functional that, that the perfusion CT decide how big the penumbra is, and then do a risk-benefit analysis for endovascular treatment based on that in the not too distant, distant future. So you want someone at a endovascular center because they have the capability of taking the clot out, right? And then the transport, again, will be decided. They'll, they'll, the centers will talk to each other and say, yep, okay, here's our CAT scan, here's our patient, it looks like a large vessel occlusion. Um, most likely a stent retriever can help us. It's going greater than six hours. Or let's say, Someone woke up with the stroke. That's a common problem. So they go to, they woke up, call the ambulance. Ambulance, you bring to the emergency department. You're in the ED. Last known well. Gosh, last night it's been 10 hours. What do we do with that? You'll image, right? You're not a TPA candidate, right? So then what you're going to do is you're going to do your cerebral blood flow monitoring, see if there's a penumbra, looks for a large vessel occlusion, 
and make a judgment whether or not you should try to take that clot out. Sorry, what you basically what you're pointing at is that the larger hospitals, more of the larger hospitals will be adopting this new modality. Yes. So that they can do the TPA and then do the thrombectomy. Right, but see, it's multifactorial because not only do you have to have the radiology suite and the skilled endovascular guys that can pluck these clots out, but also you need to take care of people with strokes too. In other words, stroke management is a multidisciplinary process. You know, everyone from the speech therapists to the to respiratory therapy, uh, re rehabilitation. I mean, there's a lot of things that go, are involved in stroke care. In other words, so if you have a comprehensive stroke center, you're going to do all that. Now, clearly, if someone has a subarachnoid hemorrhage because an aneurysm broke in their brain, they're going to have a long hospital course, you know, and they may not survive the hospital course uh, just because of all the ramifications of the hemorrhage on their brain. So there's more to it potentially than and more to deciding exactly where you end up at what center for your long-term or middle-term stroke management. The emphasis here is on, again, first 24 hours, or the, it's basically getting brain saved, time is brain as fast as possible. Um, I hope that answers the question there, you know. Thank you. All right, thanks very much.